what is happening with the elders at the kingdom hall? I mean, let, let's talk about it. Where are they going? What is happening with these men? Are they generally bad men? Or are they generally good? Are the elders sincere? Are they dedicated? Are they well-meaning? Now, everybody has a different answer because everybody has seen something different. They've experienced something different. Uh, you can go and read all sorts of internet horror stories. You can go on JW Net and, and all these other places and, and just, just hear all these terrible things and these, these elders and they're, they're stupid and this and that. And really, we could probably be a little more fair. We could probably be a little bit more balanced about it than just taking that position. Now, personally, some people have had horrible experiences. They've had a run-in with the elders. There's an elder that was getting into their business, was telling them what to do, or there was some uh, wrongdoing and, and they got hurt feelings. Uh, but see, then there's a lot of others that primarily have, have good impressions in dealing with these men in their congregation. I mean, I can honestly say that the congregation that I belong to, I didn't have a beef with any of these these brothers. They they were doing their best with limited knowledge. They were trying to encourage, they were trying to motivate, and they were trying to just basically follow the rules. To me, that's kind of the point. The elders are products of the structure. I'm going to say that again. The elders are products of the structure and the policies within the Jehovah's Witness movement, within the Watchtower Society's guidelines. Now, that word product in math terms, you know, remember that in math, you know, what is the product of two times three? Two multiplied by three equals six. That's the product. So you got the structure and the policies of the Watchtower Society, the way things are run, multiplied by, you know, what goes on in the Kingdom Hall, and the way that people are raised in the truth to not go to school or for higher education, uh, keep your head down and pioneer, get whatever job you can, be zealous. So your typical elder, he's a product of that environment and that structure. He could be a bank teller, a woodworker, a window washer, a loan officer. I think he's generally a sincere guy. He's generally a motivated guy, he keeps his nose clean, and over time then you see he graduates to the status. Sometimes it's because his dad's an elder, but not always. And, and, and I can honestly say that for the most part, those brothers recuse themselves. They don't make a big deal if, if a family member is up for consideration to be an elder. They, the, those brothers usually just keep quiet about it and they let the other brothers kind of decide. That's just my experience. But anyways, now you've got this, this man. He might be a young man. He might be 29, 28, 31, 36, whatever. He's now an elder. He's a hiding place from the wind and the rain, the shadow of a heavy crag in a parched land, however that verse in Isaiah goes. So the next point to me is, is why are so many of these brothers dropping off? Why are so many of them stepping down? You see, here again, now we come to the struggle. One of the things that, that really kind of got J.W.'s struggle started was, you know, uh, I was an elder for, you know, uh, around 10 years. You know, I just couldn't take it anymore. Then you've got other brothers. You got uh, uh, Andrew on the site. He stepped down, an elder for many years. Couldn't take it, had to resign because of conscience. You've got Siam. Couldn't handle it anymore. Had to step down because of conscience. Things get so disgusting spiritually for some of these men. The worship of the governing body, the devotion to it, the devotion to rules. And many of these brothers, because of conscience, not because of wrongdoing, not because they're lazy, quite the opposite. Not because they're not conscientious, it's because they are conscientious. They can't, they can't take it anymore. They have to, they have to stop. But there's, there's hundreds of brothers like this. There's so many. You see, things get leaked onto the internet, right? The recent letter about the switch to a 16-page magazine. You know, the, the, the Watch Turn and Wake used to be 32 pages. Uh, now it's going to be 16 pages. And they're going to consolidate 
um, the websites and more of the articles are going to be online only. Well, who leaked that? Was it just one elder? There's just one elder and he's this bad apple that leaked it? No. Dozens, dozens of elders are leaking things like this. Hundreds of them are posting anonymously on websites, chat rooms, and forums. It's not one guy. It, it reminds me of Acts 4, 19 and 20, when the apostles were ordered to stop preaching. And then in Acts 4, 19, in reply, Peter and John said to them, whether it is righteous in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, judge for yourselves. But as for us, we cannot stop speaking about the things we have seen and heard. There's those among us, they're dissenters, they're dissenting Jehovah's Witnesses, and they cannot stop speaking about the things that they have seen and heard. And this is affecting many of the elders. Where are they going? Where are they going? We're losing a lot of them. They're hurting. They are hurting and they are burnt out uh, and they get down just like any other rank and file publisher does. But you see, many times they have nobody to go to. They are not allowed to really talk about it. It would be an embarrassment to them. It would be a humiliation to them. So they have nowhere else to go, you see. And so they turn to an anonymous source via the internet to talk about their problems and to commiserate. Now, I'm going to relate a couple of emails to you. I'm going to condense them for the sake of brevity and also, of course, take out a few things so that this brother is not, you know, going to be identified or embarrassed or anything like that. But here we have this, this sweet, sincere, lovely brother. He sends me an email. Uh, we'll call him James. James emails me and he says, uh, I was born into the truth. My parents have been faithful witnesses for 50 years. I'm currently serving as an elder and have done so for nearly 20 years. I'm well known in my circuit. I'm consistently used for assembly talks. I conduct the congregation watchtower study. An issue I have is regarding higher education. Back when I came through high school, the elders and society pushed pioneering in Bethel service and looked down on higher education. As a result, I have a high school education and nothing else. My younger years were spent pursuing kingdom interests. Now I struggle to make ends meet with menial service-related jobs. The lack of education has always shut doors for me and will continue to do so. What bothers me is that other brothers that have come into the truth in recent years and appointed as elders have come in with college degrees and an education and do well. In fact, most of these brothers are used extensively, and this is undoubtedly due to their previous education and training. I also have some problems with the society's view of higher education, and to addition to the whole disfellowshipping procedure, I think both views need tweaking at the very least. There are countless brothers and sisters as myself that have forgone higher education to focus on Jehovah's service. I have no regrets whatsoever in that decision. However, the recommendations given at the time to totally dismiss education was incorrect in my opinion. I had opportunities to do both. To take advantage of college scholarships while living at home and still pioneering. As a result, many of us still around find it difficult to care for our families and keep ourselves moving forward in the very thing that has kept before us, Jehovah's service. Many brothers and sisters, are, as myself, are now subjected to low-paying jobs that require many hours, physical exertion, just to stay afloat. Many brothers have to work on weekends and evenings, which takes them away from their families, from service, from the meetings. Yes, the view of higher education has somewhat softened in view of the times we're living in. Many of the Bethelites that are reassigned back to the field after years of service are subjected to menial jobs and have to rely on the kindness of other brothers and sisters just to survive. What does a person do if they're now 55 years old, spending 30 years at Bethel and then they're told to leave? Could there have been some other preparation for these friends to adjust to their new life outside of the only thing that they knew their entire adult life? Also, this fellowshipping seems to be inconsistent in the way it is carried out across the organization. I do agree that a practicer of things mentioned in the Bible, such as fornication, adultery, drunkenness, etc., needs to be shown the error of his ways. And this person cannot be tolerated within the congregation. There's no place for that whatsoever. 
However, is it truly carried out in a spirit of love? For example, a disfellowship sister continued to make every meeting after her announcement. This went on for many months, and she was hardly ever missing. She came to the meeting to find a seat and sat down in the middle of the auditorium. It was the only seat available. The publisher next to her got up and moved to the other side of the auditorium and waited until another seat became available. It was as though the disfellowship sister had leprosy and was contagious. Is that loving? How do you think it made her feel? Another disfellowship sister stated that during the one year she was out, no one ever made eye contact with her. They never smiled, never even acknowledged her existence. It was as though she was invisible. She made every meeting with the exception of a four-week period that she had major surgery and no one to care for her. Not even the judicial committee would give any subtle indications that they were happy to have her still coming to the meetings to get her life back on track. Is that loving? People have contemplated suicide because they were disfellowshipped and had no one to talk to, no one to encourage them, and no family to look after them. They feel as though everyone in the world has turned their back on them. They made no worldly friends because all their friends were witnesses. So they contemplate just ending it all to kill the pain. Is that loving? Additionally, here is an eye-opening fact. There are countless brothers and sisters that have not come forward with indiscretions due to the fact of their fear of being disfellowshipped. They have no family, no friends outside of Jehovah's Witnesses, so they cannot deal with the consequences of what might happen. And so they take their chances and pray to Jehovah, hoping He will forgive them. I take issue with the procedures and policies we see coming down. Elders are asked to do more and more, and yes, we get so bogged down in policy and assignments that it leaves little room for anything else. As a result, baptized brothers are no longer reaching out for overseer because it is not perceived as something desirable. Many brothers work hard to care for their families and congregation responsibilities, only to see their children and wife suffer. This goes on for years, and in the end, Many times the children leave the truth, and the elder is shown the door because he failed to care for his family in a proper way. In many cases, I see, the elder did the best he could under the circumstances, but he is left humiliated after giving his best to the congregation for many years. Could there be some type of arrangement for elders and their families to receive encouragement? Could there be an arrangement for elders to take time off periodically to care for other matters on a rotation basis? These are just a few examples that I see as a challenge for us. Am I ready to give up? Absolutely not. But in many ways, things are just too rigid right now. And unless there are some changes made in the policies and procedures, it will only get worse. I believe in Jehovah and Jesus, and that will never change. But I do feel some viewpoints have to change. I feel I'm in a dead end and will only exist unhappily until I die. Your thoughts would be appreciated. Your brother, James. How does it make you feel when you hear a letter like that? How do you react to this kind of a story, these kinds of feelings? Your heart just goes out to a brother like this. There's so many good ones. There's so many sincere ones. They're trying but when you're inside of a flawed structure, when you're inside of an oppressive regime, what do you do? You want to change it from the inside. You want to make a difference. You want to do good where you can do the good. And on an individual basis, a lot of good can be done. Individual brothers and sisters can be benefited by a loving elder, by a loving shepherd. But you see, so many are disgusted by the watchtower worship of the GB. The governing body is elevated. This, this uh, phrase, the slave, is repeated over and over dozens of times in an, in an article so as to become propaganda, so as to become a slogan, so as to become a mind control technique. This happens, you see. This indoctrination goes on and they step down. They can't take it anymore. So many of us have had to step down and resign. Or as this brother has done, they soldier on. A few of them just simply are out, completely out mentally. Some of them don't even believe in God anymore, but they continue to do it. Maybe it's because of the position, the status, the power, habit, inertia, the social pressures of it all. You see, the way things are set up, it is built into the way this structure is set up, the way the hierarchy works. The governing body answered to no one, basically. 
There is no uh, accountability. There's no checks and balances there. The same thing within individual elder bodies operates for periods of time. Yes, they have to do whatever the slave tells them, whatever the branch tells them, and they have policies and procedures. But to some extent, you have uh, these congregations where the elder's been around for eons, and his his dad was an elder. Now he's the elder, and he's the coordinator of the body. He's in charge. Uh, he's got a strong personality. Then there's things like the Shepherd the Flock book, the Elder's Manual. This is the 2010 one. Page 38. There's a horrible loophole that's here. It says, if it comes to light or an appointed brother confesses that he has committed a disfellowshipping offense years in the past, the body of elders may determine he can continue to serve if the following is true. The immorality or other serious wrongdoing occurred more than a few years ago, and he is genuinely repentant, recognizing that he should have come forward immediately when he sinned. Perhaps he has even confessed to his sin, seeking help with his guilty conscience. He has been serving faithfully for many years and has evidence of God's blessing and has the respect of the congregation. Do you understand what this means? What this means is they are saying that if you are an elder, you can commit a serious wrong, hide it for a couple of years, then confess show repentance, confess to the other elders, and you won't even get judicially reproved. You won't lose your privilege of commenting. You won't lose any privileges. You'll remain an elder, and no one will ever know. And I actually saw this happen in a previous congregation where I served, by the way. So this isn't just in theory. This section of the book was referred to, and a brother was preserved as an elder even though he had committed uh, fornication prior to being appointed an elder. If that elder, when he fell into immorality or whatever it was, if he would immediately come forward, that'd be it. He would be deleted. He would be put on restrictions. You see, the, the Shepherd book also brings out that if someone comes, and of course it's applying to the rank and file now, the publishers, if a publisher comes forward and admits serious wrongdoing and repentance is there, well, restrictions must be imposed. Whether it's just a few months without commenting or you can't give talks for a while, you can't carry the microphones anymore, restrictions must be imposed. But here, as long as you're an elder and you hide it for at least a couple of years, a few years, then you can come forward and if you've been serving faithfully and if you have evidence of God's blessing, if you have the respect of the congregation, well, there's your out. Really, again, how, when you hear these things, you hear this letter that this brother sent, you hear these loophole situations that are built into the policy structure. Where are all the elders going? What's happening? We're not losing the worst elders. In many cases, we're losing the best ones. Who suffers? That's the sad irony of it is who suffers? The sheep suffer. Jesus' little sheep. Th these brothers and sisters at the Kingdom Hall that, that are asleep in the, the witness structure, we need to give them a break. They don't know. This is all most of them have ever known. They are trying their best to serve God. And regrettably, they are the ones that suffer. Remember the end of the book of John? Jesus appears to the uh, disciples that had gone back to their fishing business. Remember, he says to Peter, feed my sheep, feed my little lambs. He wasn't just talking about door knocking when he said that. Feed my sheep. He was talking about encouraging and upbuilding and shepherding the Christians, the disciples of Christ, to give good advice, to give good encouragement, to help ones to expand their righteousness and their service to God, not to contract or curtail their Christian liberty and their freedom. See, help ones to do more good deeds, not narrow their point of view down to a tiny slit like Eskimo sunglasses so as to lessen the brightness of the world. Have you ever heard about that? You heard about the Eskimo sunglasses? They invented sunglasses thousands of years ago. And what they would do is they would take a whale bone 
uh, find like a curved piece and they would cut little tiny slits and then they would get some leather straps and they would lash it or tie it around the front of their face and across their eyes and they made sunglasses because you know it's just so blindingly white out on the the snow that's how they did it just little tiny slits that they would look through as they trudged through the snow so we don't want to be caught up in this this tunnel vision with these tiny little slits that we're looking out of and unfortunately that is what has happened with a lot of these brothers with some of these elders you want Christ Jesus point of view his heavenly father's point of view the love that he had in his sermon on the mount Matthew chapter 5 he talked about stop judging stop hating your enemies pray for your enemies love those that don't love you So it's sad, but we come to see why so many elders are leaving, why so many elders are dropping out, burning out, getting out. But on the other hand, perhaps there is a silver lining to this. You know, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, we're not necessarily losing all these good men. They might step down, but they're still a good brother. They can still be a good Christian. They can still strengthen their brothers. Remember that? Luke 22, 31 and 32, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, look, Satan has demanded to have you men to sift you as wheat, but I have made supplication for you that your faith may not give out and you, when once you have returned, strengthen your brothers. I know some of these gems, some of these gifts in men, as that scripture says. You probably do too. But you see, As we start to wake up to the truth about the truth, as we start to see what's important, a status and a position is not important. Getting the accolades from men is not important. People used to come up to me, oh, you're such a great speaker. And, you know, I liked that. I got used to that. You see, that's a problem. We have to put our ego aside. Brother Graybeard has taught me that, and he has really helped me with this, and I have to continue to work on that. We all do. And these elders do. You have to put your ego aside. You have to humble yourself like Paul did, like Jesus did. Be a humble and lowly in mind person. It's easy to have that mock humility. I've seen that in a few back rooms and in a few elders meetings many times. Dozens and dozens and dozens of you other elders that are listening and that know about it have seen that. It's the way the structure is set up. When you build a pyramid, there's only a few that stand at the top, at the peak of it, when you build a pyramid out of people. And so when you have that rarefied position, how else can you, what else can you do? But you see, we have gifts in women, we have gifts in men, and it's not about the status, it's about their love and their spirituality and just living their lives. We can live our lives and everything we do the way we serve God. You know, Ecclesiastes 3, 10 through 13, I want to read this from the ESV Bible. It says, I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. We deserve to be happy and enjoy the things that we do. Not uh, study into the wee hours of the morning because we've got uh, two parts on the meeting the next day. The policies and the procedures that weigh these brothers down, that get in the way of of the pure and simple gospel, the pure and simple gospel, the worship of God, service to Christ. This is what our focus should be on, the elders' focus should be on, brothers, sisters, active witness, inactive witness, uh, whatever status or label that is applied to someone. So it's so sad. We're losing a lot of these best ones. We're losing the cream of the crop. But we gain them back in another way. And that's an encouraging thought. They come to sites that build them up. 
they start to realize that they can do a lot of good. I take solace in that. I feel like I can do good. I can still encourage ones. And I know a lot of you other brothers feel the same way. And that's what we do. We do what we can do. Maybe we go and we volunteer. We help feed homeless people. We give advice and encouragement to other brothers and sisters that don't feel comfortable going to one of the elders because they don't want to get in trouble. So now you're the unelder. They can go to you. Whatever it is, we serve and we do what we can. So we don't need a status. We don't need an appointment from some brother in the service department that has never even met us and never will. It's meaningless when it's not in Christ, when it's not for the right reasons. So elder or not, we can do that. Male or female or not, active Jehovah's Witness or not, we can do that. Elder or elderly, sick or healthy, we can all strive to be older men and older women And we don't have to go anywhere. Because remember, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, whom shall we go away to? You have sayings of everlasting life. And so we go to Christ. We go to the scriptures. We go to our heavenly father on bended knee. And that's where we need to go. We don't have to go anywhere else. If you're listening to this information and you already are an elder or you served as an elder, you're going to relate to it. You're going to understand. And we can pray for these ones that they will wake up to the flaws, that they will wake up to what is going on with these policies and these procedures that are being dictated to them that are not scriptural. And and that is the prayer that I would like to give at this time to close this information. Our dear Heavenly Father, please continue to watch over those that are trying to do the right thing, those that are trying to serve you in sincerity and in love. We know that there are many thousands of congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses that have elders that are trying their best, that are getting burnt out, some even losing faith in you and in in your word because of the stress of it. We ask that uh, there can be a softening, that there can be some improvements in these situations. And even this uh, dear brother James that uh, emailed me, give him strength, give him your Holy Spirit and all the other ones that are suffering because uh, they feel worthless. Please be with those of us that are listening to this information May we choose upbuilding things to feed our minds on. May we use it to strengthen our resolve to serve you. May we use it to build up our faith and not allow this world or negativity, negative people to tear us down and make us give up. So we do love you, Heavenly Father. We thank you and we love our Lord Jesus as well so much that we come to you and we all say in his name. Amen.